Right, welcome back everybody to this, the third part of lecture five in the experimental design and analysis series in core skills. And in the final section of this lecture, we're gonna look at assumptions of parametric statistical tests uh, using the t-test, which we've been looking at already as our kind of exemplar statistical test. We're gonna try to get to grips with the assumptions that test makes. And this is gonna follow on into the next lecture. We're only gonna deal with some of the assumptions or one really key assumption now. Uh, and that assumption we're going to look at now is in the, the assumption of independence, that the data are independent uh, except for the um, variables that we're interested in. So um, this is going to bring us on to the topic of pseudo-replication, which is a bit slippery, but really important. Right, so the t-test makes a bunch of assumptions, like uh, any statistical test, and in particular, parametric statistical tests make um, significant assumptions about the underlying distribution of the data and that's um, in that sense the t-test is typical of, of any parametric statistical test. But the first assumption I want to look at is the assumption that the observations that we're studying are statistically independent and that doesn't sound like it means very much written like that and it takes a good deal of unpicking and a good deal of experience before you're able to detect problems with independence and yet they can turn out to be absolutely critical in interpreting your results. So a lack of independence arises when data points share something in common other than the things that you're interested in testing. So I guess if we look back at the previous example of the, um, the sperm speed, swimming speed in um, control mice and mice that have been treated with the drug, the assumption is that the data points we get from the mice in each group are entirely independent except for the fact that they share the treatment in common. They're either all control mice or they're all mice treated with the drug. Problems arise if that's not the case. If, for example, we take repeated measurements from the same individual mouse, then those data points would share something in common, which is that they would come from the same individual as well as the fact that they came from the same treatment. Um, and that's one example of non-randomness essentially in the extraction of data from individuals. So if, uh, if there's any other non-randomness in there, if for example all of the mice in the first treatment came in the first batch of mice that were available for the lab and then all of my control mice came in another batch that was delivered on a later day, then that would be a, a lack of randomness because the, in, the mice in each of the treatments would share something in common other than the thing that I was interested in. So this is a quite a tricky thing to get your head around. Um, oh, I'd forgotten I've got a slide all about this. Um, so yeah, we were careful in the sperm study to allocate each mouse that we had available to us at random to one or other of the treatments. So we had a batch of mice in the lab and we took each mouse and then we essentially tossed a coin and said, is this going to be a control mouse or a treated mouse? So that by the time we built up our data set, we knew that the data were truly independent. Each data point came from a different mouse and there was no, um, nothing that the mice shared in common in a treatment group. So the data points would not have been independent if we had done something different. So we may have been short of mice and we might think, well, let's take multiple sperm samples from each individual. Let's say we're trying to get 30 sperm samples from a group of mice, but we can only afford 10 mice. We might say, well, let's take three sperm samples from each mouse. Now, those groups of three data points that we get from the three samples from a single mouse share in common the fact that they came from the same mouse. And that effectively changes the statistical power that we thought we had. We thought we had 30 replicates, a sample size of 30. But in reality, we've really only got a sample size of 10 and we've got three sort of, um, well, what we call pseudo replicates within each mouse, from each mouse. And this can be, I mean, if you push it to the extreme, let's imagine we were trying to be really cheapskate and only have a single mouse in the control treatment and a single mouse in the drug treatment and we take lots of repeat data points from those single mice, we've now got a really big problem because any difference between the two treatment groups could in fact arise simply because of random variation between individual mice. Uh, and again, it's always worth pushing these things to extremes. Imagine if some of the mice in our sample of male mice had been sexed wrongly and were actually females. 
If that randomly affected a few data points in a well-designed study, it wouldn't matter. But in the terribly pseudo-replicated design I just described, where we have all of the data coming from a single mouse in each treatment, if one of the mice in the experiment happens to be a female, or infertile for some other reason, or dead, then we might find that all of the sperm from that individual behave very differently, or maybe there just aren't any sperm, in which case we would get a spurious result, see a seeming, uh, it would seem like we got an effect of the treatment, when in fact all we were doing was seeing the difference between Charlie the mouse and Gemma the mouse. Um, okay, so, so this is a big, big issue. Um, in the kind of study I've described with the mice, there are lots of reasons why you might end up with a lack of independence, and some of them are much more subtle than others. So you might think that you're, say, putting your hand into the mouse stock, like you might house your mouse in f mice in family groups um, in the lab. You put your hand into the cage, you pull out a mouse, you put him into the control treatment or the drug treatment, and you're doing that in a random order. Um, or rather, sorry, you're picking a random mouse, you think. You're just bunging your hand in, grabbing one, and you do your first 10 and you put them in the control, and then the next 10 you put them in the um, drug treatment. What if the order in which you're able to catch the mice is affected by their behaviour and their general health status? So that, in general, you tend to catch the healthier, zippier mice later because they're more difficult to catch. If you have put all of those in the control treatment, you've now made the control mice have something in common, which is that they're all a bit more difficult to catch, a bit livelier, and that could impact on the results you get. So there are lots of reasons why um, data may end up being not independent, and unfortunately that causes really significant problems. So what we're talking about here is essentially poor sampling strategy leading to this phenomenon of pseudo-replication. In other words, what appear to be replicates are not really replicates. So I've tried to explain that in the context of the previous study, but I don't know whether I did a good job of it. So let's have a look at a clean example and think about how you can reach the wrong conclusion from a study if you don't design your sampling strategy sensibly. So we'll look at an example which is quite close to home because this is research that's been done in the school. I'm pretending that they designed the study badly. In fact, they designed it very well. The study was designed to look at the effect of exercise on learning in school children, primary school children, because there's this kind of long-standing hypothesis that um, students, uh, children doing, doing exercise in, in, in school is, is kind of healthy and good for learning, and that if you allow kids to kind of run around, keep fit, then they will tend to learn better than kids who are sort of couch potatoes glued to their tablets. So um, although this is kind of a, quite a well-known idea in the media and in, in, in the public, it hadn't really been tested until scientists from our School of Life Sciences went out there and actually had a look at it in, uh, using an experiment. So the idea was that they took kids and gave them an exercise regime and then they looked at how good they were at learning. Um, I think it was immediately after exercise, so um, they would kind of have a regular exercise regime and then they tested them, um, tested them academically. And of course, they needed control children who weren't doing the exercise regime, who were also being tested on the same academic skills so that we could compare whether um, the addition of the exercise regime improved their learning. So the, the basic design of this study was to give 100 randomly selected kids in one school an exercise plan. So we've got a big school, obviously not everybody's gonna participate. Everybody who's willing to participate, we randomly select 100 children and we give them an exercise plan where they have to do a set of exercises. Meanwhile, we go to another school and we select 100 kids at random who are given maybe some relaxation task or meditation task, which takes an equivalent amount of time to the exercise plan. So it's kind of using the, the kids' daytime in the same kind of way, but without the physical exercise component that the, the first group of kids are getting. And then we run our academic tests and we look at the results to see whether uh, the kids were learning better in one group or the other. And um, at the end of this process, we find, using a suitable statistical test, that the kids who were given the exercise uh, regime were performing significantly better, on average, than those who were given the relaxation and meditation scheme. And at, at the end of that, you might think, right, great, we've, we've essentially been able to reject the null hypothesis, that there was no effect of exercise on learning and instead conclude that this 
long-standing idea that exercise is good for kids learning is correct uh, well there's a problem there's a giant problem in this in this study design and it kind of hopefully was obvious maybe not because um, actually although it's sort of blindingly obvious when you know it's there it's not always obvious when you see a lack of independence there's a crucial lack of independence in this design the way that I described it was that I took a hundred kids from one school randomly selected within that school but they're all from the same school and I give them an exercise regime and then I go to another school and I select a hundred kids and give them the control regime where they're not doing exercise that is um, hugely problematic because each school will be different for random reasons which have nothing to do with our exercise regime and we've uh, designed the study so that all the kids in the school that was given the exercise regime share something in common other than the exercise regime and that is the school now this school might be a school which does more exercise in general or it might be a school that's in a wealthier area of town where the kids tend to have better diet uh, better education at home outside school all those kinds of things for whatever reason the kids in that school might show better performance than the kids in the other school where we gave them the control treatment and the change in performance might be solely driven by the difference in the school rather than the difference in the exercise regime. So what we've essentially done in here is introduced a confounding effect of school identity and the replication that we seemed we, could ha we had, the, the individual kids, the 100 kids in each school, well those were pseudo replicates, they weren't real replicates because they weren't independent, they shared in common the fact that they were going to the same school. So this is the essence of pseudo-replication. It's where your replicates actually have something in common. They're not independent. And that means that the, uh, any test of, of a hypothesis that you think you're doing turns out to be either less powerful than it, than it originally seemed, or it actually is just logically not telling you what you think it's telling you. So with any experimental design where there are problems there is normally a room there's normally room for improvement. So in this case there are ways in which we could improve the design. You can think of at least a couple I can think of at least a couple of ways of doing it. One easy way to do it would be to um, select a, a, a wider variety of schools, let's say half a dozen, and randomly allocate to each school either the control treatment or the exercise treatment and make sure that we have replicate schools in each treatment. So if we have six schools and three schools in each treatment, we have, our true sample size now is three. In the original design, the sample size really was one, uh, but in neither case is the sample size 100 because the kids within a school share the fact that they're in that school in common. So um, experimental design impacts on independence and independence logically impacts on what you can infer from a, an experiment or a set of observations. So why then would you deliberately introduce a lack of independence into your study design? It turns out that that's what people do quite often and for very good reasons. So we'll try and look at an example of that um, in the context of what we call paired experimental designs, which are a common form of experimental design where the data are deliberately made to be not independent. And we'll look at it through a case study um, of a diuretic. Okay, this is a drug that's given to patients to help them uh, go to the loo, essentially, um, and, and thereby reduce their blood pressure. And it's called uh, triantarine. Uh, and this drug, it was noticed after they started using it with patients that something weird happened, and that was that their urine actually turned blue, uh, bizarrely. So let's imagine we've observed that uh, some patients are complaining of having blue urine once they've gone onto this drug, and we want to know whether this is just a, you know, a coincidence or whether it's really the case that patients that have taken the drug have blue urine. And so that's that's the study design we're going to ask. I mean, sorry, the study question we're going to ask: Does triantarine make your urine turn blue? So um, the null hypothesis here is that once we treat a patient with triantarine, you do not see uh, any difference in how blue the urine is. And um, so we're going to take a bunch of people and give them the drug and a bunch of other people and give them a, a placebo and compare their urine using a, a sort of a spectrometer measurement of colour because you can actually measure how blue a, a liquid is by using a spectrophotometer. Um, now we know, and you're probably aware of this, that urine colour varies a lot both um, 
within a person, you know, different times of the day, for example, you, you will see that your urine is different color uh, and it varies from person to person as well. So there's a lot of background noise here and we're interested in um, the impact of this drug, which might be quite subtle. Um, and we might, when we go out to, to run the study, struggle to recruit people who are willing to do this because it's maybe a little bit invasive and personal to have your urine colour tested and also having to take this diuretic drug might not be ideal. So this might be quite difficult. Like many, many medical trials are, are pretty expensive and, and difficult to run, not least because recruiting patients is tricky. Um, so rather than what I originally suggested, which is taking two groups of patients, one of, who, one of which is given the drug and one of which is given the control, especially given all this background noise and the shortage of patients, there might be a better design, a paired experimental design, which allows us to economise on how many patients we use and to some extent helps us to get around the problem of the fact that each person is very different. Um, so what we're going to do is a paired study where each patient has their urine measured then they're given the drug and then it's measured again. So each patient effectively acts as their own control. This is a kind of classic before and after study and it's very common in, in medical trials where you take a patient uh, or, or a, a volunteer who's healthy or indeed who has an illness and you give them a treatment and then and you look at what happens afterwards. So um, this is what we call a paired test because each two data points um, share something in common. They come from the same person. So from each patient we get two data points. They are paired, uh, in this case before and after treatment, but you can have other um, things that happen in these pairs. So in the study that we're going to look at we've got 20 patients and we measure on a spectrophotometer how blue their urine is and it comes out as this kind of strange metric in units that we don't need to worry about. But each patient has a measurement before and after and what you can see just in the before measurements is a huge variation in the colour of their urine which could be for all kinds of different reasons. Um, but what we're interested in is how the colour changes during the course of the experiment. With it. So even though this patient here, for example, has got very blue urine, um, so they've got a high measurement here, uh, we're interested in whether that measurement gets bigger or smaller once they've been treated with the drug. And in this particular case, actually, they get, the measurement gets slightly lower, so it looks like they get slightly less blue. Um, and this, by looking at the same patient tw uh, twice quickly in succession, we've kind of got rid of some of the problems caused by the fact that each patient is very different. So um, we're looking at the transition between before and after and actually if you run your eye down the data these are the first seven data points you see that in five out of seven of the cases after treatment with the drug the level of blueness increases. So that's beginning to suggest that maybe there might be a small effect of the drug on how blue your urine is, even though there's a lot of background variation in how blue it is to start with. Um, so we collect all 20 patients worth of data and we can plot it on a graph like we have done before. This is the mean blueness before and after um, treatment. And it looks like it has gone up a bit after treatment, but the difference is not huge. The error bars here overlap just about. It looks like we're not really sure whether this is a significant difference or not. Obviously what we need to do is run a test. And without knowing any better, you might reach for your independent samples t-test. So the t-test that I've described to you so far is more properly called the independent samples t-test. And the clue is in the name. The assumption is that the two samples that you've got are truly independent. And as I've said, in this case, actually, we know they're not. And they're not because pairs of data points come from the same patient. But if we'd pressed ahead with the independent samples t-test, we would have got a t-value of 1.48 and a p-value of 0.16. So that means there's a 16% chance of observing this difference between the means at random under the null hypothesis. And that's quite a large chance, not sufficiently small that we would ignore it and reject the null hypothesis. So the conclusion of the study at this point, if we were to use this independent samples t-test, would be that there was indeed no significant effect of triamterene on how blue your urine is. But this is all based on a false premise, and that is that the data are independent. Instead, what we actually do is run something called a paired samples t-test, which takes account of the fact that the data points are paired. Um, and it has a very different result. Effectively, what a paired t-test does is it looks at the change in the response variable, in this case, how blue your urine is, within each pair. Um, and it asks whether, on average, that change is greater or less than zero. 
because obviously if there was no effect, if the null hypothesis was true, the average change from one patient to the next should be zero. So uh, on the graph to help you here, I've shown you what the average change is in this particular study. And you can see that it is positive and the error bar doesn't overlap zero, which suggests that the true mean change is not uh, equal to zero. In fact, it's greater than zero. And we can confirm that by running a statistical test, which is the paired samples t-test. And hey presto, we get a different t-value now, a bigger t-value, and a significant p-value. p is less than 0.01 in this case, so it's less than 1 in 100. So you're, you won't see that kind of average change before and after the drug is administered in how blue their urine is, the patient's urine is, um, even as much as 1 in 100 times, if the null hypothesis is true. And the conclusion, therefore, has to be that the null hypothesis is not very good. We're going to reject it and conclude that triantrine does indeed turn your urine slightly blue, which indeed in actually is the fact with this uh, particular drug. So we got a very different result because we recognised the lack of independence in the data set. And essentially, this paired samples test is a more powerful test because we are able to ignore the variation among patients in sort of background blueness and instead home in on the change before to after in each case. There is a word of warning here, which if you think about it carefully, if we just go back to our design, um, there is, uh, there's an issue here. We've taken a measurement before and after the drugs were given, but other things will have changed during that time period. We've gone from maybe morning to afternoon, or maybe it's one week and then the next week. I'm not sure what time course we would run this experiment over. We need to give the drug time to work. Um, and other things change over time. The patient gets fractionally older. It becomes afternoon rather than morning. They maybe have lunch. There are lots of things different between the before and after data points. So when we reach our conclusion that there's a significant difference between the before and the after data, we aren't 100% sure that that's because of the drug. It could be for some other reason. And that's a disadvantage of this kind of study in that it doesn't really rule out the confounding effect of time. Um, but nevertheless, at least the analysis we've got is the correct analysis to reach the conclusion that the before and after data are indeed significantly different. Whether that's the result of the drug is not absolutely nailed down yet. Okay, so these um, paired studies are very common, in particularly in medicine, but in other fields as well. And um, they're an example of what we call a repeated measures design. Repeated measures because we're taking multiple measurements from the same individuals. And in my study, I was talking about multiple individual patients, but it could easily be individual petri dishes or individual species or individual genes. Um, the key point is, are you going back to the same one and getting data from it on multiple occasions? In which case, if you are, you're doing a repeated measures design, often before and after, but they can be in other forms as well. You could have 10 or 20 or 100 data points from the same individual, looking at how things change over time. Um, or indeed, uh, they may not be taken at different times, but they, well, yeah, no, let's park it there. Um, so the, the advantages of a repeated measures design is that, as I've said, it cuts down on the number of patients. We can essentially use each patient as their own control. So that's in the example of a study of patients. But if it's a, a study of mice or a study of bacteria, you're cutting down the number of replicates that you need in total. But they are generally more difficult to analyse, these repeated measures designs, and they do um, sometimes suffer from the kind of confounding effect that I described in that previous example. OK, so that's the end of this uh, lecture, and we're going to carry on in the next session looking at some of the key assumptions of parametric statistical tests as we started today.